of its members is named after Leona Tyler. Leona would be proud and pleased that the most recent recipient of her award is Melba Vasquez. Melba and Leona share many life experiences in common. Prior to graduate school, they both taught English to junior high students. They both provided influential and cutting edge leadership to university counseling centers. Both studied and published on individual and cultural differences and on adolescent girls and women. Both served as president of Division 17. And both served as APA president, a position not often filled by women. In 1973, Leona was the 82nd APA president and one of the first women to serve in that role. In 2011, Melba was the 120th APA president and the first woman of color to serve in this top leadership position. Both were great mentors of others. I had a hard time here with present and past because Leona has died. Melba's still alive. Uh, <laughs> I've used the past tense, but I should use the present tense. <laughs> in, in each of their own ways, they were perfect leaders for their times. With all of these life experiences in common, I'm guessing Leona Tyler, if she were alive today, would be thrilled that Milba is giving the Leona, Leona Tyler address. First and foremost, Melba's career has been defined by a commitment to social justice. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said in 1957, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are we doing for others? And Melba's whole professional life has been about doing for others, especially those who are targets of discrimination, oppression, exploitation, and injustice, those who've been left out of psychology studies and psychology textbooks and those who lead daily lives that require great resilience and fortitude to overcome the stress and strain of racism, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia. Her scholarship has focused on ethics, multicultural and women's issues, and supervision and training. She is the co-author of three books on ethics and more than 80 journal articles and book chapters. This extensive list of scholarly productivity is truly remarkable because Melba has spent her career in independent practice without the support of university infrastructures. As you can imagine, Melba's list of honors and awards is extensive. She is the fellow in 11 APA divisions. She is a diplomate in counseling psychology and the recipient of over 30 national awards. Melba's career involves lots of firsts. First generation college student, first in her family to go to graduate school. She was a member of the first cohort of APA Minority Fellows. She went on to be a founding member of the 1999 Multicultural Conference and Summit. She was also a founding member of two divisions of APA, Division 45, the Society for the Psychological Study of Ethnic Minority Issues, and Division 56, Trauma Psychology. Yet her biggest first was being the first woman of color to serve as APA president. Melba took full advantage of the power of her presidency. She appointed and supported three major initiatives, all topics near and dear to her heart, immigration, discrimination, and K-12 educational disparities, all topics that have been understudied and people who have been underserved by psychology. Melba found the very best people to bring the latest knowledge and expertise to these task forces, the scientific evidence amassed in these task force reports is voluminous, and the recommendations continue to guide APA public policy today. Melba's keen eye for critical issues goes far beyond psychology and has resulted in the dissemination of psychological science to policymakers and APA briefings on Capitol Hill. In anticipation of making these introductory remarks today, I wrote to Melba's colleagues with whom she has worked closely over many years. Common threads run through their reflections. Here are some of their descriptions. A unifying spirit, a leader who listens carefully 
and who lives and breathes inclusion in everything that she does. A woman of great integrity, a pioneer, a visionary leader who guides us to a better future, a woman with a big, huge heart full of joy and excitement about the possibilities for change. Some more quotes from Melba's colleagues. One of the luckiest days of my professional life is when I met Melba. Whether we're discussing topics where we are, we are closely aligned or arguing about issues in which we are on opposite sides, I always come away with new ideas, different perspectives, and a deep respect for Melba's ability to disagree without being disagreeable. Another colleague, her organizational leadership skills are first rate. She always has a clear understanding where an organization is and where it needs to go. She's a brilliant strategist about how to get from here to there, always listening and learning from others. She's a superb model of what it means to be respectfully uh, to respectfully disagree. And another comment, I have watched with admiration over these many years her gift for leadership, her constant drive to use psychology to better the life circumstances of others. And this one, my favorite, she possesses many special qualities that cause me to say, I wish I could be more like Melba. <laughs> Compassionate, caring, gracious, generous, courageous, relentless, formidable, fierce, fearless. Friends and colleagues, I present to you my dear friend, Dr. Melba J.T. Vasquez, one of the wise and seasoned elders in counseling psychology and one of the most extraordinary leaders of modern American psychology. Yes. Melba. and thank you all. Um, I'm moved to tears with that introduction. Um, I don't think everybody, anybody has ever said such nice things. Um, and it's so nice to see so many friends in the audience today. Uh, and I am just tremendously honored uh, to receive the Leona Tower Award for Lifetime Achievement in Counseling Psychology. I met uh, Dr. Tyler in 1980 when I was elected to serve on my first APA board, the Board of Social and Ethical Responsibility in Psychology, BSERP. It later evolved into BIAPI, the Board for the Advancement of Psychology in the Public Interest. I was in awe to meet Leona Tyler, along with a number of other amazing pioneers. But it was later that I appreciated the full extent of her influence. When we're young, we don't know um, how significant these people are that we're rubbing elbows with. Um, at least not the extent, I, I, did, I did know some. She was a true pioneer, as Linda said, who focused on counseling as a means of encouraging natural developmental processes, exploring cognitive structures and their role in organizing individual experiences and choices. She focused on developmental psychology and explored cross-cultural differences with respect to individual choice. She collected data from Amsterdam, India, and Australia and found that the greater the influence of environment on career choice, the narrower the choices demonstrating how environment interacts with individual variables with respect to perceived choice. She was one of the first to acknowledge that. And this was a unique contribution to the literature. In addition to around 100 articles and books, Dr. Tyler was involved in administration and community and professional service. She served in many leadership roles including as president of Division 17, and our division honored her by naming this highest award after her. Her service contrib uh, contributions included ser sitting on many boards and committees at local, state, and national levels, including Amnesty International, Common Cause, and other peace organizations. And as Linda said, in 1972, she became the 81st president and fourth, wo fourth woman to, uh, to be elected president of the APA. I decided to talk to you today about my interest in leadership and social justice, which I call mujerista leadership. 
In particular, I wish to provide evidence to make the case that diversity in leadership is a compelling interest for society and will present the case for promoting Mujerista and other diverse leaders. My comments are based in part on a chapter that I wrote, The Value of Promoting um, Womenist and uh, Mujerista Leaders, in a book edited by Thema Bryant Davis and Lillian Kamas Diaz, entitled Womenist and Mujerista Psychologies, Voices of Fire, Acts of Courage. It's a picture of the book. Changing demographics are fostering an examination of leadership and diversity. We're living in a period where society desperately needs leadership that understands at a very deep and nuanced level the critical and challenging issues related to race, gender, and other issues of diversity. We need talented, wise, diverse leaders in all aspects of society, including governmental, corporate, nonprofit worlds, and organizations such as ours. Only recently have scholars begun to address the diversity of leaders in terms of culture, race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation. Consequently, the ability of research and theory to address some of the most important aspects of contemporary leadership have been constrained. I'm going to describe key issues identified by Eagley and Shin that include the limited access of individuals from diverse identity groups to leadership roles, the, the shaping of leaders' uh, behavior by the intersections of identities as leaders and as members of racial, ethnic, culture, or gender, or other identity groups, and the potential of individuals from groups formerly excluded le from leadership roles to provide excellent leadership because of their differences from traditional leaders. Understanding the key issues involved in leadership diversity promotes understanding for optimizing leadership in society. I wish to describe how diversity in leadership is a compelling interest for society and will pre present the case for promoting womanist, mujerista, and other diverse leaders based on the belief that they have much to offer society. Now, despite increasing representation of women and racial and ethnic minorities in leadership, a significant underrepresentation still exists. Economic, econ economists, sociologists, psychologists, and others have explored the reasons for the underrepresentation including gender and race gaps in wages and promotions, and have investigated such issues as human capital issues and variables like education, training, job experience, as well as structural factors, occupational segregation. The near unanimous conclusions are that such variables only account for a portion of the gaps and that discrimination is a more significant factor. Sanchez, Huclis, and Davis posit that the United States is not producing enough leaders to meet the organizational demands. They suggested that women of color are among those from diverse groups who can fill the void, especially since there are indications that women are, are highly suited for more advanced leadership positions. Such leaders have the potential to have tremendous influence on the personality of a system or organization. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor conveyed her belief that diversity in leadership is a compelling interest. During the 2003 Supreme Court decisions of Grutter versus Bollinger and Gratz versus Bollinger, allowing consideration of race to ensure that there is a critical mass of racial and ethnic minority applicants in higher education, Justice O'Connor declared that it was important and necessary to cultivate a set of leaders with legitimacy in the eyes of the citizenry. A university education is important, she believed, so that the path to leadership be visibly open to talented individuals of every race and ethnicity. She believed that universities are partly in the business of training a leadership core for society, and that a society with racial and ethnic tensions can benefit tremendously from having an integrated leadership. Recently, on June 23rd of 2016, Fisher versus University of Texas, uh, the Supreme Court affirmed the constitutionality of an affirmative action program uh, used by the University of Texas to increase diversity among the student body. These perspectives affirm with judicial authority the existing national consensus that the presence of diversity in leadership positions in society is compelling. I think there's still a national consensus. We'll see. Uh, so. Okay, so what makes a good, liter a good leader? What does the literature say? 
Expectations about good leaders are changing along with demographic changes. Eagley and Chen made a strong case for the importance of diversity in the workplace and called for leadership theories that acknowledge and promote the value of diversity. As leadership theories become more inclusive and integrative of a more global complexity and interdependence, more diversity and expectations of what makes a good leader will be accepted. Research indicates differences in leadership style, but not in leadership effectiveness between men and women. And evidence demonstrates that female leaders are effective as leaders. An evolving image of leadership includes recognition of, quote, people skills, including a feminization of leadership and more relationship-focused styles, the Asian management style, as highly effective. Alternative models of leadership include relationship-oriented traits, the importance of teamwork and consensus building, and an effective work-family interface. Eagley and Chin argue that gender, race, and ethnicity have a psychologically, psychological reality at deeper levels than the surface of the human body. Those who view surface variables lead to categorizing and stereotyping by the perceiver. These variables also serve as central aspects of people's self-definitions. Though self-definitions are influenced by an attempt to live up to the standards congruent with identities, resulting in identities based on group membership that affect behaviors in organizations and groups, including the exercise of leadership. They also make the point that the experiences that result from their identities, including discrimination, and how they have come to negotiate minority and majority cultures result in lived experiences that can also influence leaders' effectiveness. They propose that the common emergence of strength-based and resiliency models among members of group who have been excluded from the privileges in society, including from leadership, are important to consider. Indeed, many who have been marginalized combine that experience with their opportunities and privileges to obtain leadership to promote and advocate for improvement in the conditions related to oppression for marginalized groups. In fact, Caldwell and Vera identified those who care about social justice through a qualitative critical incident research design, critical incidents that cultivated a social justice orientation among counseling psychology doctoral students and professionals were identified. Analysis of rank ordered items in indicated that the ca categories of exposure to justice and influence of significant persons were most frequently ranked as the most influential critical incidents in the development of a social justice orientation. Thus, the lived experiences of those who have been exposed to injustice as well as being exposed to those who teach, model, and mentor those values to others promote the development of a social justice orientation. The Caldwell and Veda findings and the Eagley and Chin theoretical position lead me to consider that the developmental models of womanist and mujerista identities may be related to leadership effectiveness. Most studies have found that participants with higher levels of womanist internalization attitudes had higher levels of self-esteem. In the final stage of this developmental model, internalization, the woman fully incorporates into her identity her own positive view of what it means to be a woman and refuses to be bound by external definitions. So I propose that the lived experience of having womanist and mujerista internalized attitudes lead to a more effective leadership experiences, particularly in the ability to not only develop, learn, and apply leadership skills, but also to promote the values from the lived experience and to influence others as well. For example, empirical research on federal appeals court decisions indicate that in sex discrimination and sexual harassment cases, female judges were significantly more likely than male judges to find for the plaintiff. Even more interesting was the finding that the mere presence of a woman or black on a three-panel appeal court increased the probability that a white male, that a white male would find for the plaintiff that experience of influence. The implication is that the presence of a woman of color or other person with a diverse identity in most settings 
may not only increase social justice attitudes and behaviors, but may also influence awareness of colleagues, including increased understanding and empathy for the perspective represented by that identity. Is this true for all women of color? Clearly, we're not talking about the superficial descriptor of skin color, language, race, or ethnic identity of a woman or of other diverse aspects of identity. I believe that it is the case if it, the person representing that identity had been through a process of understanding key relevant aspects of their identity and then has developed the ability to communicate the lived experiences, challenges, perspectives, and views of members of that group in an effective manner. This leads me to the definition of mujerismo. So what is mujerismo? Um, Nigrin, Saba, and Moreno, and others provide a definition of mujerismo and related women of color feminism. We define mujerismo as a system of thought or a worldview that centers Latina women's concrete experiences, sources of knowledge, and survival strategies. Mujerismo shares some common themes with other worldviews that can be grouped under the category of multicultural feminism or women of color feminism, black feminism, Chicana feminism, decolonial feminism, US third world feminism, and womanism. All of these racially conscious strands of feminism center the unique experiences and perspectives of women of color while promoting liberation, self-definition, and self-determination for all women. They all articulate the intersectional analyses of oppression, recognizing how socially constructed categories of race, class, gender, sexuality, and nationality overlap and intersect with each other, shaping women's and men's experiences and opportunities in ways that position us multiply as both oppressed and privileged. They all assume that institutional racism works in gender-specific ways and that institutional sexism um, works in race-specific and class-specific ways. They all explore how various levels of oppression interact and reinforce each other. And this includes the micro level of face-to-face -face sexism, acts of prejudice, insults, microaggressions, harassments, and violence against women. Together with the larger institutional structures of gender oppression, and finally, the cultural realm of beliefs, assumptions, and ideologies that promote or legitimize women's subordinate social class and status. Lastly, racially conscious feminisms assert that women of color possess a unique perspective based on social location at the intersection of racism and sexism. This social location provides women of color with a privileged epistemological standpoint from which to discern how oppression and dominance operate. I believe that the experiences and processes implied in these definitions approach a description by Eagley and Chin about how diversity contributes to more effective leadership. The presence of diverse leaders in society is significant for numerous reasons, as described previously. Exposure to justice is a critical incident identified by Caldwell and Vera as leading to caring about social justice, along with the influence of significant persons. So women of color leaders who have the lived experiences resulting in mujerista or womanist identities can promote positive changes in institutional and organizational life and may bring unique skills, values, and perspectives to their leadership activities. They may have the capacity to be constructive social justice change agents in their communities. I'd like to um, describe a case in point. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor is the first Latina appointed to that role. Justice Sotomayor was in Austin a, a couple of years ago, and in one of her interviews that I attended, she made a very touching comment that people perceive poor neighborhoods as riddled with crime. Now, Sotomayor grew up in a poor neighborhood. She indicated that, in fact, the majority of poor people are hardworking, contributing members of society who reflect dignity, goodness, and compassion for others. This brought tears to my eyes then, and it does now, just recalling it. To have a Supreme Court justice who knows that reality is so important 
having people with this kind of background in positions of leadership is significant and critical, especially in key decision-making positions who have ultimate power to influence others and society. In a 2014 Supreme Court decision, Shuet versus Baum et al., brought by the Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action, the majority, unfortunately in my opinion, reversed a lower court decision to set aside Michigan voters. Um, in 2003, the Supreme Court upheld uh, affirmative action, so the voters voted against it. So proponents of affirmative action brought it back to the Supreme Court, and the, um, the Supreme Court upheld the voters' decision they didn't question the principle that consideration of race is permissible, but it did validate the belief that voters and states can choose to prohibit the consideration of racial preferences. Now, Sotomayor uh, articulated the minority report with clarity and elegance. I love reading her minority report. Her articulation suggests the importance of remaining open to approaches to ensure that persons are treated with fairness and equal dignity and have access to the credentials that lead to increased diversity in leadership and society. She referred to the importance of race-sensitive admissions uh, policies. She stated in, court, in part that while our Constitution does not guarantee minority group victory in the political process, it does guarantee them meaningful and equal access to that process. It guarantees that the majority may not win by stacking the political process against minority groups permanently, forcing the minority alone to surmount unique obstacles in pursuit of its goals. Here, educational diversity cannot reasonably be accomplished through racial mutual measures. And she said, I quote, I firmly believe that our role as judges includes policing the process of self-government and stepping in when necessary to secure the constitutional guarantee of equal protection. Because I would do so here, I respectfully dissent. Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor reminded the court that for much of its history, our nation has denied to many of its citizens the right to participate meaningfully and equally in its politics and provides evidence of that. She further articulated a principle that she describes as elementary and essential to our equal protection jurisprudence that is, that governmental action cannot deprive minority groups of equal protection when it alters the political process in a manner that uniquely burdens racial minorities' ability to achieve their goals. She articulated the belief that race-sensitive admissions policies can further a compelling state interest in achieving a diverse student body precisely because they increase minority enrollment, which necessarily benefits minority groups. And she states, quote, constitutionally permissible race-sensitive admissions policies can both serve the compelling interests of obtaining the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body and inure to the benefit of racial minorities. Sotomayor most clearly articulates her belief that race matters because of the long history of racial minorities being denied access to the political process and because of persistent racial inequality in society that cannot be ignored and that has produced stark socioeconomic disparities. She concludes that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to speak openly and candidly on the subject of race and to apply the Constitution with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. So what leads such an articulate, wise justice of color who understands the experience of people of color and who has the courage to dissent versus another justice of color who seems to reject support of all the legal constitutional opportunities ironically provided him and his own accomplishments? OK, I'm talking about Clarence Thomas. <laughs> My hypothesis is that Sotomayor would be categorized as mujerista, and that the process of becoming mujerista has resulted in a sensibility and approach to power, knowledge, and relationships rooted in convictions for community uplift. Clearly, women of color and members of other diverse groups who obtain leadership have potential opportunities to take courageous advocacy positions that make a difference in society in the context in which they provide leadership and power. On a much lesser scale, I had such opportunities. As Linda said, um, I served as the first Latina and first woman of color president of the APA for 2011. 
and I was able to designate social justice as a major theme for the annual APA convention in August 2011 in Washington, D.C. Uh, one of my highlights was when a young African-American man said, I came, I came to AK as a graduate student and I swore I'd never come back and 10 years later I'm here and it's not my grandfather's APA anymore. <laughs> that was nice. And when Jim and I were at the airport leaving at the end, um, an elderly African-American looked at me, looked over at me, went over and shook my hand and said, I've been a psychologist for 40 some odd years and I stopped coming to this convention and I came again because I saw what it was about and I'm so glad I did. Those were two highlights for me that were just amazing. Um, in addition, um, Linda has already mentioned the presidential projects. Those reports are amazing. The task forces were incredible and um, I hope you um, access those reports because they, they were uh, produced by very hardworking expert researchers. Uh, they were vetted by um, uh, members of the APA boards and committees and received as official reports by the 170 Council of Representatives, the governing body of APA. Uh, <clears throat> because of the strength and salience of these evidence-based resources, we've already held congressional be uh, briefings in Washington, D.C. over the last uh, few years on the very important and timely topic of immigration, for example. So these are the visible outcomes, but being present on the board of directors uh, allows for many more behind the scenes influences. I see heads nodding, many of you have been in leadership know that being at the table makes a difference. So representation of diversity in leadership of various aspects of society is slowly increasing, but there's still challenges. Himowitz and Shell Hart described some of those challenges symbolically by applying the term glass ceiling it's a term popularized in the 1980s to describe a barrier so subtle that it's transparent yet so strong that it prevents women and minorities from moving up in the management hierarchy. Now Hillary Clinton put several cracks in the U.S. presidential glass ceiling in 2008 and a bigger one two weeks ago um, when she officially became the Democratic nominee. And she's attempting to totally break it in November of 2016. Regardless of your political orientation, you have to know that this is a historical event that has incredible meaning. Eagley and Carly use the term labyrinth to describe the uneven path of upward progression for women in organizations um, uh, involving challenges, indirect forays, and ventures into foreign territory. Others describe increased barriers posed by the sexism and racism that women of color encounter and use the symbolic terms such as concrete wall, hitting the concrete wall, or sticky floor. Research has demonstrated that differences in educational levels, training, job experience, and or occupational segregation only account for a portion of those gender and race gaps, as I said earlier, and that um, promotion and, and that discrimination is a, a contributing factor. So, despite convincing evidence of the effectiveness of female leaders, they face several challenges and barriers. Research has confirmed that, that discrimination by the majority population is largely responsible. Uh, for the underrepresentation, discrimination, bias, and negative stereotyping on the part of those in power, as well as structural systematic discrimination of root causes. The evidence indicates, unfortunately, that people, both men and women, report preference for male bosses. It is more difficult for women to be promoted into leadership roles than it is for men. It's more difficult for women to be perceived as effective leaders than it is for men. If they're strong and assertive, they're called cold and the B word, right? Um, certainly unpopular or unlikable. And leadership challenges are higher for women of color than white women uh, and men. Other uh, internalized challenges um, that result from discrimination include stereotype threat, um, the anxiety involved from being fearful that you're going to fill a negative stereotype, um, and that then causes you to underperform. Um, also, the tendency to hold back. Um, there's research that surveyed a number of women and none of them expected to be in the leadership positions that they were in later. More isolated as leaders and the experience as one of my um, uh, corporate women of color described the experience of being on the outer edge of the inner circle. You make it into the inner circle but you're always on the outer edge, never fully belonging. So to increase the 
the, the, the uh, representation of women, uh, women as feminist leaders in society, a variety of both organizational and personal strategies are recommended. Jessica Henderson Daniel, the only woman running for AP president this year, by the way, and I, she and I published a chapter in 2010 that identified and recommended organizational strategies for empowerment, including mentoring um, people who have been negatively stereotyped, particularly require positive, optimistic mentor, supervisor, employee relationships. I feel so lucky to have had a number of excellent mentors, uh, including peer mentors of some of the people in this room. Uh, expression of non-ambivalent belief in capabilities, constructive criticism, the importance of conceptualizing intelligence and abilities as expendable qualities, promotion of an environment where diversity is respected, leadership training, examples of leadership training um, include our own uh, Society of Counseling Psychology Leadership Academy that uh, former President Barry Chung started as his initial in, um, as his presidential initiative and that continues to this day. Um, the Leadership Institute of Women in Psychology, many of the faculty are, are members of our uh, society. The State Leadership Diversity Training that was established by Jennifer Kelly that, that provides leadership training when the state officers gather every year uh, to, um, to uh, get their training. Personal strategies include risk-taking, persistence, acquiring credentials, skills, and abilities, learning from mistakes without allowing them to define us, supporting others who make mistakes, transforming pain, rejection, and loneliness into constructive action and energy, finding and providing men me mentorship and self-care, including healthy relationships, collecting identities that, that emphasize, uh, collective identi identities that emphasize family loyalty, lead women of color to fall back on families to provide support. I feel so lucky to have the support of my family, especially Jim Miller, my spouse, who's sitting there. Wave, Jimmy. Wave, wave, wave. <laughs> uh, lending a hand of support to others on an individual community and societal level is an empowering strategy as well. We do need more research. Many have described the importance of incorporating dimensions of diversity in leadership theories and uh, research. Although there are similarities in the histories, experiences, and values of members of racial, ethnic groups, there's still much diversity within them and among us. And the important goal is thus um, to uh, increase research in, of women of color as leaders, including whether successful women of color leaders might have more of a tendency to score high on these womenist and mujerista measures. This also includes research on the complexity associated with the intersection of the multiple identities that result from identification with more than one salient identity group. Socialization in more than one identity group include, changes a wide range of psychological processes such as personality, cognition, perception, attribution, social interaction, and identity development. So women, including women of color, have made tremendous strides in acquiring career achievement and leadership in the past few decades. However, there's still many, cha many challenges. Um, research has confirmed theoretical perspectives as to why women and women of color, in particular, are underrepresented. Discrimination, bias, negative stereotypes, as well as structural systematic discrimination are all part of those issues. During a dinner with Dr. Leona Tyler, some of us asked her if she had some thoughts about what allowed her to be such a pioneer in her capacity to achieve and serve in leadership. She indicates, she's very clear about, about where she got her motivation. She said that when women obtained the vote in 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, her mother believed and in, in, in conveyed to her when she was a teenager that women were here, heretofore equal and could do whatever they wanted to do. She internalized that belief. She internalized that belief. And she reported that her, she, um, she just decided that she, that was what she was going to do. I believe that there are more women leaders, I believe the more women leaders we have, the more diversity we see in leadership in society, the more young people will believe that they too are capable of serving in such roles and we will have a greater capacity to utilize strength and talent among members of our society. 
As Michelle Obama said a couple of weeks ago, I'm sorry, it's not a very good picture, but, uh, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> She's gorgeous. Yeah. She said, and I quote, because of Hillary Clinton, my daughters and all our sons and daughters now take for granted that a woman can be president of the United States. And she also said, Hillary Clinton has the guts and the grace to keep coming back and putting those cracks in that highest and hardest glass ceiling until she finally breaks through, lifting all of us along with her. Again, regardless of your political orientation, you must admit that the presence of a woman in the White House, like the presence of a black man in the White House, is life-changing for the identities of those from the groups, but also normalizes the presence of individuals from those groups in those roles. Now this is one of my favorite pictures. This is a story about the little boy who asked if President Obama's hair was like his, and Obama spontaneously bent down and said, well, touch it, see what you think. So in conclusion, the goal is to increase the diversity, number, and effectiveness of women from diverse backgrounds and multiple identities as leaders, and to encourage their desires, skills, experience, and vision to be change agents in their communities. The contributions of womenist mujerista leaders can lead to positive changes in a variety of settings and opportunities for leadership experiences and leadership training can increase the diversity, the number, and effectiveness of women of color as leaders. Although a minimal amount of research has been conducted with women of color, identity variables we know can, lead, can affect a leader's style, behavior, emergence, and effectiveness in many complex ways. The presence of diversity in leadership positions in society is critical and compelling. I'd like to acknowledge some women of color leaders in our, in our uh, society. Um, Evelyn Hunter, is Evelyn Hunter here? There she is, hi Evelyn. She put together this list for a survey as part of her Leadership Academy project. And uh, I apologize, I added a few names, uh, Evelyn, and I apologize if we've left off some key people. But here are some amazing women who've already contributed so much. Some have been around for decades, some are, are, are younger, but we just really appreciate these women of color leaders in our society. There are many, many up and coming leaders like Evelyn, some of whom have been through the Leadership Academy, who leave me feeling very confident about our division and about psychology in general. There are many other allies, including women and men from other diverse groups, as well as white colleagues who help contribute to the goals of diverse leadership. Maya Angelou said that a person's success is bought and paid for by the people who have gone before them. Generations of women fought for decades to obtain the vote for women, and few lived to see the day that the right to vote was met, uh, ratified. Many of us have had opportunities because of the literal blood, sweat, and tears shed by people we do not even know. Uh, people took risks and made sacrifices so that unknown and unseen generations behind them would have opportunity, and I encourage us all, as we move into leadership, to be sure to reach back to lend a hand of support to others with our votes, with development of policy, advocates, with our assets, and our influence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions. It's a uh, quarter till according oh, to my watch, till. so we have five minutes if people want to. <laughs> Comments, reactions, thoughts? <sighs> She's left us speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yes. Yeah, I'll ask a question. Um, Oops, what did I do? Sorry. The past year has been uh, particularly difficult and challenging uh, with seeing all the um, violence and racial trauma in the news. You had. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Are 
affected by this and wanting to see more from our organizations and wanting to do more as leaders in our organizations to respond to those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, what thoughts or, or, or insights might you share? You know, I really appreciate APAs getting information out to us um, ab about all of this. I appreciate the research um, that is going on about what, increase, what incre increases bias on the part of police um, and um, the incredible amount of police training that is going on around the country. That is so important. And for us to have that knowledge and information, um, who, who is a Stanford woman um, researcher that does fMRI research, for example, that um, her name is on the tip of my mind. She, she did fMRI research where she showed um, uh, people a picture of a black face and a white face, and the background was a, a very vague outline of a gun. When people saw white faces, they did not recognize the gun. When they saw black faces, they recognized the outline of the gun. That kind of objective research that uh, that shows us insidious bias can help us explain to people how it's not your individual fault but it is our fault if we don't become more aware of our implicit biases and how we can work to change those and we're the ones that have the ability and some of some of us are involved in doing bigger widespread um, trainings but we can also teach people that information a person at a time we have to have that information keep ourselves educated about those kinds of implicit biases and how important it is to to take action be advocates um, how many of you have taken part in um, black lives matter or any kind of other um, activities that are supportive of the community yes the more we do things like that i think the more um, helpful it is. I think there are multiple ways that we can take action. One of the best, um, one of the best anti-anxiety and anti-depressive um, uh, interventions is take action. <laughs> and so, anything we can do that we feel uh, we're doing to take action would be helpful. Anybody else have some suggestions about that? Because <laughs> we all have to keep learning from each other. Thank you, Melba. Thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. So, so, I don't know if you remember me, but we met uh, with Don. 